Well, welcome everyone to Media Justice Fundamentals, the Spring 101 series. That's right. You weren't expecting sound effects, but there will be sound effects today. Um, the Media Justice Fundamentals uh, Spring 101 series is a, a workshop series that's produced by us, Media Justice. And for this workshop today, which is being facilitated by me, um, this is, uh, my name is Steven Renderos, I guess I should say that. Um, and, uh, this is a series of workshops that media justice is producing this spring. Uh, here's a listing of some of those workshops from that are coming up. Um, and obviously it's not Tuesday, April 6th. You don't need to double check your calendars. Um, we had to unfortunately uh, delay this workshop by about a week. So thank you all for, for those of you who still stuck with it and came out today. So appreciate that. We're in Media Justice 101 Part 2. But these are a couple of the workshops that we've got coming up over the next few weeks. So highly encourage folks to stay tuned uh, and to attend those workshops that are being led by other members of the Media Justice team. Um, today's topic, of course, is part two of Media Justice 101, and I'll catch you up, uh, up in a bit about what we covered in part one. If this is your first ever media, uh, event with Media Justice, I just want to welcome you. Um, a quick word on Media Justice, and let me get out of the way so that you can see my wonderful staff here. Uh, let me see. There we go. So, you know, Media Justice is an Oakland-based a black and brown led organization that fights for the media and technology rights of people of color in the United States. One of the core principles that guides our work is the belief that the right to communicate belongs to everyone. Um, we're also the host of a national network called the Media Justice Network. And if you're a member of our network, welcome. So wonderful to have you all here. And if you're not a member of the network, we still welcome you, uh, but you should talk to Adriana about joining. Um, all right. So again, today's topic is titled Media Justice 101, Part 2. So what was Part 1, you might ask? So in Part 1, we actually focused on, you know, one of the kind of oldest forms of media here in the United States. Um, and let me see if I can switch my slide. There we go. And I'll come back on screen so that you can see me. Um, yeah, we talked about the, the history of the newspaper. Um, we explored racism in newspapers, the ways in which newspapers from very from its very early days, going back to the first newspaper in the United States, the public occurrence um, helped to shape racist narratives that continue to define black and POC, people of color, media representation today, as well as where people of color have fought to control our own stories. And we learned about um, incredible kind of pioneering journalists like Ida B. Wells and Jose Marti. Uh, we learned about the rise of the black press and its role in telling the story of the black experience here in the United States. So. So we, that's a lot of what we covered and in a bit I'll, I'll actually ask folks for those of you that were here last time to share a little bit about what you what you learned so stay tuned for that. Um, before diving in I'd be remiss if I didn't shout out um, some of the organizations and leaders whose work have highly influenced the content of today's workshop. Uh, so that includes you know, groups like Global Action Project and our very own Media Justice, which before we were known as Media Justice, we were known as Youth Media Council. And here on screen, I have um, a couple of our, you know, a couple curriculums that were highly influential, at least to me, um, Global Action Project, uh, which was a youth media organization group based out of New York City. Um, produced a really groundbreaking um, political education curriculum called Media in Action. And the version you see here on the on the left side is um, kind of a an updated version of that curriculum. Um, they actually recently um, shut, you know, closed their doors after many, many incredible years uh, of leadership in the field of youth media and youth media organizing. Um, in their work, I know will continue to live on and, and so many of the, the youth and people that they've impacted. And I certainly count myself as one of those folks. Um, and I also want to shout out on the left, you'll see a curriculum called Communicate Justice 101, 
which was a curriculum that I came across early on in my career as a media organizer. Um, it was produced by the Youth Media Council, which is what uh, media justice was originally called. Um, and, and yeah, so th those two pieces of curriculum are highly influential. I also want to shout out uh, a couple kind of longer essays and books. Um, one is News for All the People, which was written by Juan Gonzalez and Joe, and Joe Torres, and it chronicles the racial history of media in the United States. Uh, lastly, I also want to shout out Media 2070, which is a research essay detailing the history of U.S. media participation in anti-Black racism um, and issues a call to action to repair the harm uh, media institutions have caused. So I, I invite you all to read this powerful essay and dream up reparations with us at media2070.org. And I'm sure there'll be a link to that um, in a bit. Um, but this incredible essay was written by some of the black staff at uh, an, an, an allied organization that we work very closely with called Free Press. Um, it includes folks like Alicia Bell, uh, Joseph Torres, who also wrote News for All the People, Colette Watson, um, and others at Free Press. <clears throat> All right. So one last bit of housekeeping before we get into it. Um, I wanted to make sure that you all are familiar with the tools that we'll be using in today's workshop and to make sure that your experience has interact, is as interactive as possible. Um, obviously, I'll be talking for quite a bit, but I'll be relying on certain tools to help me make this, uh, this, uh, this workshop a little more interactive. And, and the first tool we're using is Zoom. And I know many of us have gotten really familiar with Zoom over this past year, but there are two features that I for sure want to kind of draw your attention to. The first is the speaker view, and, and hopefully for most of you, uh, the speaker view is what you've got turned on, um, which would just be, as you see you know, on the slide behind me, seeing the speaker in a big view. Um, if you're seeing me more in like a Brady Bunch style view, then you're in the gallery view, and, and we need to switch that to speaker view. And the reason I'd like folks to switch over to speaker view is because, as you can tell, as you can see, I'm being fancy and I've got my slides in my background. Um, so it's a way for, for me and for you to not have to worry about looking at anywhere else um, for slides and for content. Um, so that's the first feature. And to change um, from gallery view to speaker view, um, you just kind of float your way up to the top right of your Zoom screen, and it'll either say speaker view or gallery view. So if you can click on that and get to this kind of view that you're seeing, um, that would be great. The second feature I just want to direct you to is the chat box. Um, I, from time to time, I'll ask folks to you know, post some messages into the chat box. Chat box. So I want to make sure that you have it open. Um, so if you can go over to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a little icon and you know, little icon with a bubble, and uh, it says chat. If you can click on that button, it'll open up the chat window. And then let's move on to talk about Mentimeter, which is the tool that we'll be using for today's presentation. Um, I'll actually be using Menti as well to collect responses from you all throughout the workshop. Um, and there are actually two ways that you can get to Mentimeter. The first way is by using your cell phone. So if you pull out your cell phone and open up your camera, um, you can use this QR code. So all you have to do is actually point your camera to the screen and it'll automatically open up a link and take you to where um, you know, the Mentimeter presentation is located. The second way that folks can get there um, is through a link that I believe my folks are already putting into the chat. Thank you so much. Um, and that link will automatically take you to the same exact place. The advantage to opening up Mentimeter now is you'll also have access to my slides there. So um, if you want to, if you prefer to look at my slides through your cell phone or on your computer in a separate window, you can do that. Um, so from time to time, I'll be asking folks to go to Mentimeter. So please take a, a moment to at least open up that window. All right. So I think we're all ready to jump in um, and we can actually practice using Mentimeter right now. So I wanna start out by getting to know who's in the room. 
So if you go to Menti, um, I'd love for folks to just populate in just your name, pronouns, and location. Where where are you dialing in from today? Um, so if you can take a, a moment, and we'll probably start to see answers pop up in here um, pretty soon, as soon as folks get there. And I'll take a pause. Welcome to see you. It's good to see you. All right, we got folks from San Jose, from Minneapolis. Love Minneapolis. That was my home for many years. Brooklyn's in the house. When Brooklyn's in the house, they're usually pretty loud, so you can tell. Yeah, Brooklyn, Lenape land, that's right. Yeah, okay. Relax, Brooklyn. I see all the Brooklynites already starting to, starting to pop off in the Zoom. All right, Urbana, love Urbana. What's up, Chad? It's good to see you. <clears throat> so yeah, y'all are getting the hang of it. So if you haven't gotten to Menti, go ahead and jump in there. Put in your name, your pronouns, your location. It's also a good way for you all who are sitting at home to check out you know, the, the breadth of the places that people are coming from. Awesome. Got more New York. Got a Portland in there. Welcome, Portland. <clears throat> awesome. So I'll give it just another minute before I jump ahead to my next question. Yeah, let's see what we got. Yeah, Shea, it's good to see you, Shea. Hi, Fernando, San Jose. Cool, cool, South Bay. South Bay is coming in strong today. Appreciate that, as well as, as, well as the Midwest. Um, cool, cool. Well, folks can keep populating in there. It's going to get recorded into the slides and we can always come back to it in a bit and shout outs to folks coming in from Boston. What's up? Um, the next question I wanted to actually ask for folks to dive in on is, did you attend part one of this workshop? Curious, uh, if we've got any returning folks and yes or nah. Wow, a lot of returning folks. Cool. Okay. Wow. Mostly returning folks at this point. That's wonderful. Well, I am actually, you know, for folks, for the folks here that haven't attended part one, there is a recording of the workshop and we're currently working on making that widely available soon. I've heard rumors that it's going to get broadcast somewhere. So if you randomly see me talking out of a TV in Philadelphia at some point, um, shout out to our member out there, Philly cam. Um, but anyways, we're work, we've got a recording. We're going to make it available soon. Um, and you can learn about some of the messed up history that I talked through in part one. All right, so great. A lot of you were, were in part one. I'm wondering if I could get a couple folks, and I literally mean like two responses um, of folks coming off of mute and just sharing maybe one thing that has really stuck with you from that workshop. And if you unmute, if you can share your name and your pronouns, that'd be wonderful. Um, can I get a couple volunteers? I'm getting crickets right now. Hey, it's um, it's Drea from Minneapolis. And hi, hi. and I use she, her pronouns, but what I really enjoyed was looking at the different ways that media um, was used to, and like when you did the study of like a old, older headlines and newer headlines and you showed how um, bias they were and how they can still like be used for today. So I, I enjoyed that a lot. And we're going to actually kind of copy you and use that with our KRSM interns. Oh, please. Absolutely. Well, I, I love KRSM as well. So shout out to Southside Minneapolis. Um, and yeah, and I'm, and, and also much love to you all out there dealing with everything y'all are dealing with. Right when I talk, I'll be Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Uh, can I get one more person to kind of come off mute, share a little bit, so maybe something that stood out for you from part one? Um, I'd like to share something. This is Don Elda. Um, I think it's still always just shocking 
shocking to see how yeah. racism and violence and doing evil is was still and is still considered a social norm. That is horrifying to me, mm. absolutely horrifying. That's right. Yeah, and I think, and, and when you see the kind of common through lines throughout history where you see, you know, studying some of the early articles that covered indigenous folks in such, you know, really disrespectful ways, um, you see coverage of black folks from a place of criminality pretty much from jump, you know, even before the United States was the United States and how there's this kind of common drumbeat um, that has reverberated throughout history and, and also where media has been used as an instrument of violence. Um, and that carries over to this day. Um, and it's all good, Drea, we got you. Um, thank you so much, Donalda. I really appreciate that. Um, all right, so uh, let's go ahead and, and keep, keep moving. Um, so I've got, I think, one more question for you all to fill out on the mentee. Um, and this is just what comes to mind for you when you hear the word technology. So we can populate some responses there. That would be awesome. What comes to mind for you when you hear the word technology? Community connection, power, surveillance. White supremacy, yeah. Afrofuturism. I'm seeing function, I'm seeing access, tool, people getting left behind, electronics, San Jose connection tools, Y2K, for those of us that were around for it, for sure, smartphone, information aid, learning, white men. Yeah. Yeah. I love that connection has kind of um, stuck as kind of a big, the biggest of the words here, which is, I think, apt. Um, I'm seeing Silicon Valley, which makes sense. It's a whole industry. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing advancement, efficiency. That's right. Those are all incredible responses. Um, and thank you so much for indulging me. And part of the reason why I bring up technology is because today I think we'll be looking to pair and talk about how technology has always been kind of central to media justice as well. Um, and in terms of a definition, I really like uh, this definition by uh, Thomas Hughes, who wrote that technology is kind of a creativity process involving human ingenuity. Um, but I think the reality is that technology is many different things. It is also it is an object, but it's also a process. It is also um, it is also reflective of who is in control of getting to shape and create technology. Um, so so all of these responses are one hundred percent spot on, and you'll find out in a little bit why why I'm harping on technology. Um, last time, uh, since we're talking about media justice one hundred and one. We also defined um, media, and we talked about media as being a vehicle to communicate to lots of people. You know, so I wanted to just kind of remind us and, and get us all on the same page. You know, what do we mean when we say media? Um, there are forms of media, and we've talked about TV. We've, you know, last time we talked about newspapers, and today we'll talk a little bit about TVs and radio. Um, but media is really just a vehicle. It's a vehicle to communicate to lots of people. And in that way, the internet is, is media. Um, in that way, you know, using uh, our cell phones, you know, using our telephones, that is a form of media. Um, now, earlier I asked about technology because it's always been central to our ability to communicate to lots of people. There actually would be no newspapers if it were not for the printing press. You could not reach people through radio without a transmitter. You know, for years um, with TV, you, you actually couldn't see television without an antenna. Um, and uh, innovations in technology have always really changed what media is able to do. When you think of TV, 
and cable actually changed our relationship to TV. And prior to cable, and I'll show you the little coaxial cable, but the infrastructure behind it, prior to that, there was a limit to how many channels, you know, our TV could get through the airwaves. And if I go back, like you'll actually see on this old television, I remember having one of these as a kid, there were only so many channels you could get up to. I think it was like a dial that only got up to like 30 channels. Um, now compare that to the world that we're living in today with cable where there are hundreds of channels. Um, you know, for the most part in the old days, um, and I'm, I'm going to be that person today. I'm going to be it back in my day. Back in my day, there were only a handful of TV stations, you know, and you had your big ones like CBS and ABC and NBC um, that were available all over the U.S. And if you happen to live in a community like I did, I grew up in Los Angeles, you know, you might get some more local channels, you know, so you might get the Spanish language TV station. Um, I grew up in Koreatown, so I, I got the, you know, Korean stations. Um, cable changed the way that, you know, that we were able to engage with content uh, but it not only changed that, it gave us the ability to get hundreds of potential TV channels. But in this like cable, you could actually deliver other things like internet and telephone calls. And I think anyone here who has had, you know, a cable provider in their home today has probably been sold a bundled package by these companies. You know, get your TV and your telephone and your internet. And that's because it can all get delivered through the same infrastructure. So as we get to the present history of media justice, technology continues to do that in media. It changes what media can do. Um, and as we'll learn through this workshop, you know, innovations in technology do not necessarily end up benefiting everyone equally. Um, and you know, furthermore, technology is not always good. So at the end of the last workshop, I mentioned that media justice was a term and a movement that emerged out of a convening at the Highlander Research Center in Newmarket, Tennessee. Um, in today's workshop, we'll learn a bit more. Um, oops, sorry, I didn't want to switch to that just yet. In today's workshop, we'll learn a bit more about um, what was happening in the world leading up to that gathering in 2002 um, to understand you know, what was the problem they were hoping to solve then. Um, we'll get to new, know the media justice movement today through two issues that have shaped media and technology from the 1980s till about the turn of the 21st century. So we're going to go a little bit deeper on media consolidation and deregulation. Now, to keep it fun and engaging, we're actually going to be playing a little game throughout the workshop. And every now and then, um, we'll have a pop quiz with questions on either content that I've recently presented on or content that I'm just curious to see if folks have an answer for from within this group. Um, at the end, uh, the top three people with the top three scores will receive a prize from us. I've checked in with some of my operations folks, and it seems like we're going to be able to do this. We have some, some wonderful stuff in our Oakland office that we'll be sending out to you, including incredible books and maybe some swag. Um, and just to, to name, um, part of how you gain scores is not only by getting the correct answer, but there is a higher score based on speed. So if you happen to answer the question more quickly, you'll get a higher score. So just letting you out, letting you know. So why don't we try it out? Um, if you folks go back to Menti on your you know, devices, and we got a lot of folks in here already. Yeah. All right. I'll give it just another minute for folks to get there. Um, and if you need to get there. You know, click on the link in the chat. Awesome. Just give it another minute before I count down the question. Awesome. All right. Let's go ahead and kick it off here and see what y'all think. Remember to answer fast to get more points. And the question is, where did the media justice convening take place in 2002? I just said it. And it's a, it's a multiple choice question here, so you get to pick. And you've got a little less than 10 seconds now to answer. Was it the Aspen Institute, Highlander Research Center, the National Labor College? All right, whoa, if you answered Highlander Research Center, you are correct. 
Wonderful. Um, so National Labor College, I threw that in there for some of the folks that have been to convenings with us in the past, because we actually used to do a lot of gatherings at that place. So threw a little curveball there. Um, yes, yeah, so 2002. Um, and oh, yeah, let's see our leaderboard here. So after we do a quiz question, we'll get to see our leaderboard and see where we're at. So right now, it seems like James is 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 running in the pole position. Chad is is right there behind James. So don't worry. There's plenty of more questions to come. You will have an opportunity to catch up. Okay. So Highlander, which if you didn't know, it's they're a member of our network, the Media Justice Network, but they've also been around for over 80 years, been a site of many movements that have turned to um, you know, many movements have actually turned to them for space to strategize, to train union organizers from the CIO in the 19, in the mid 1900s. Uh, we saw the, the Highlander Center was a critical space for seeding the plans and training that would lead to actions like the Montgomery bus boycott during the civil rights movement. You know, they helped foster a lot of the organizing that happened in Appalachia to address coal miners health and safety. Um, you know, that Highlander would help conceive of a movement known today as media justice is no surprise when you take some of that history into account. So shout out to Highlander Center. I see the link to their website in the chat. Um, they have a wonderful newsletter you should sign up for. Um, they do a lot of, especially in this pandemic, have done a lot of virtual programming to bring kind of communities of people together. So support their work. Um, now, what made the 2002 gathering unique is that it was really the first multiracial convening of media advocates from across the country. And I wanted to share you know, just a handful of the people that were there, just so you have a sense. Um, so one of the folks that was there, and you'll see them on the bottom left here, Malkia Devich Cyril, um, would be the person who would go on to found our organization, Media Justice, as well as um, helping to start the Media Justice Network. Um, Peggy Berry, Berry Hill, which you'll see here at the top um, towards the middle. Um, Peggy um, was at the time a director of the Native uh, Media Resource Center um, and an, an indigenous multimedia producer, um, Sita Pena Gangadaran, um, who at the time had co-founded MediaChannel.org, which was a clearinghouse for news and media democracy. Uh, Didi Halleck, who was the founder of Paper Tiger TV, an independent collaborative of media makers and also for folks that are involved in the kind of community media uh, sphere is someone who is an OG for sure um, in the community TV sphere. Janine Jackson, um, and uh, who was the director at FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy and Reporting, and at the time was also hosting a radio show called Counterspin. Um, Cheryl Lianza, at the time was working for a law firm called Media Access Project and represented civil rights and public interest groups in proceedings at the Federal Communications Commission. They actually even drafted um, comments on behalf of the Media Justice Network on many occasions um, back in uh, you know, almost 10 years ago. Um, Cheryl is actually now at the United Church of Christ um, Office of Media Justice, which is a member of our network. Um, Makani Themba, who founded the Praxis Project, um, and then um, is also just a brilliant racial justice communication strategist. Um, it's someone whose work you all should follow if you don't yet. Um, Anna Cisnet, who was the director of Austin Freenet, um, which was an organization in Austin, Texas, um, which way back in 2002 was trying to help people get free public access to the internet. Um, so these were just a handful. There are actually many more folks that were there um, but I wanted to highlight some of those wonderful folks um, because I think, you know, these are the folks that were helping conceive of this movement that we now today call media justice. Um, and at this gathering, they actually took an intensive look at the current media conditions that they were trying to respond to. And I'm going to go deeper, as I said, into two of those topic areas. Um, they talked a lot about media consolidation at this gathering, and they also talked a lot about deregulation. So I want to kick it off with media consolidation. Um, and to kick us off, I'm curious if folks can go to the chat and just post like, 
what do you think that means when I say media consolidation? What am I referring to? And anything that comes to mind, please feel free to populate in the chat. I see neoliberal mergers and acquisitions, mergers, question mark, mergers, question marks, capitalism. Yeah. Uh, I'll respond to mergers, question mark with mergers, period. Yes, it is. It is mergers. Um, buying local newspapers, but big city investment firms. All right. Monopoly. Yeah. Driving diverse voices out of business. That's right. Great. Those are all great responses. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, in the chat, we'll actually put in, you know, a a definition. Um, yeah, only a few companies owning all the media outlets. Who owns the media? Yeah, that's right. Um, so it's a process whereby, you know, progressively fewer individuals or organizations or corporations control an increasing amount of the shares of mass media. I didn't even realize that I blocked so many of the folks in, in the slide. So here, let me get out of the way so you can see Malkia. I did have Malkia down here in the bottom. Um, but anyways, I'll come back now. Cool. So that's right. So that's what media consolidation means. It means progressively fewer groups or people own the majority of mass media or the, the media that we consume. So uh, here goes another quiz question, I believe. And let me make sure that I get to the slide. Um, cool. So this is question two of nine. This is worth points. So let me know when y'all are ready. Um, so get back to Menti. And if folks can put in the, if our folks can put in the chat, the link to Menti, that'd be awesome. And I'll give it just a second before I press enter. All right. So here goes. The next question. Remember, more points if you answer a little more fast. In 1980, how many companies controlled 90% of US media? That means 90% of TV, radio, newspapers, magazine. Was it 50 companies? Was it 25? Or was it four companies? This is back in 1980. How many? companies do you think control the vast majority of media? And you have about less than 10 seconds. All right, let's see what we got. Okay, the vast majority of folks thought it was 25. It's actually 50. Um, that might seem surprising to some folks, although we had more folks thinking it was fewer in 1980. That's interesting. Um, yeah, it was actually 50 corporations that owned the vast majority of media. I'll talk a little bit about why it was a, you know, it was more in 1980. Um, so here is a question that's not actually. Let's check back in with the leaderboard. I keep forgetting they always bring up the leaderboard at the end of this, and it seems like that hasn't changed. All right. Well, we'll come back to the leaderboard, making sure that it works. Um, Here's another question for you all to check in on. How many companies do you think control the vast majority of media today? This question will not count for points. This is just, I'm curious what you think, and we'll see the answers populating here. All right, so we're seeing 100, five or less, okay, three. I'm seeing two. I'm seeing five, fours. We got one person who thinks it's 100. And, but just about everybody else thinks it's, it's in that five, four, three, five or less. Okay. Y'all are doing me like price is right. Just like one, one digit over seven. Okay. Cool. That's helpful. All right. So I'll, I'll come back to the answer in a little bit. Um, so let's talk media consolidation. Ooh, I didn't mean to click on that. Sorry. Um, in the book, Media Monopoly, which is uh, an, I should have mentioned at the top, this was a book that um, I ended up, you know, um, uh, studying a lot leading up to this workshop. Um, but it was written by this person named Ben Bagdikian. Um, the author goes into documenting how the media system got to be heavily concentrated. Now, this was a book that was initially released in like the late 1980s. So clearly something 
went wrong if like the book focused so heavily on media concentration, media consolidation, even way back then. But one of the interesting kind of revelations is that he finds that all of these industries like radio, TV, um, newspapers, uh, you know, even magazines, you know, even telephones started out concentrated to begin with. So take radio, for example, where this industry began pretty much as a private cartel back in 1919 when the Radio Corporation of America was formed as an umbrella monopoly. And there were four companies, four corporations that started um, RCA, General Electric, which is the same corporation that makes probably makes your stove, makes your refrigerator, uh, Westinghouse, which is another kind of industrial manufacturing company, AT&T, which y'all might know if, you, if they are your cell phone provider today, and the United Fruit Company, which they're no longer around, but you might best remember them for a couple of different things, for Chiquita Banana, but also for destabilizing a lot of countries in Central America and in the Caribbean. Um, they were among the biggest kind of collect manufacturer of, of bananas um, and imported bananas to the U.S. Um, but these four companies actually got together and said, we're going to create this, this other corporation, RCA. And what they did is they, they basically created this company to divvy up the emerging radio market for themselves, meaning they wanted to have a monopoly on radio in the entire country. And they established the first major radio station in the United States that broadcast nationally. And it was called the National Broadcasting Company, or as we know them today, NBC. But why consolidation? So let's talk about the 1960s. Um, in about the 1960s, Wall Street really got hip to the fact that media was an industry with like really high profit margins. There were, you know, many local newspapers that could generate profit margins between 20 to 40% annually. Um, yet I think a lot of the public image of newspapers coming out of, you know, the period of yellow journalism in the 1800s and the early 1900s, you know, the, the perception was the newspapers weren't this kind of like money making machine. They were just like, performing a public service. They were out there to document the news and expose corruption. Um, and that was a convenient story that a lot of newspaper owners were okay with telling um, because you know they, they didn't want to actually tell the truth, which is that they were actually very profitable. And for many years, newspapers, radio stations, they got away with telling that lie. And it's around the 1960s that many of these companies start publicly trading in the stock exchange. And as a result, um, investors and Wall Street could, for the first time, peek under the hood and see that this whole entire industry was an industry where a lot of money could be made. And not only that, but you know, owning more media meant that you could control what the public focused their attention on. And media companies use this to their advantage you know, by steering content away from topics that, you know, were controversial or that could affect their bottom lines. Today, you won't really see advertisements for cigarettes on TV or, or pretty much anywhere. But from about the 1950s on, the tobacco industry was the largest advertiser. And here on screen, on my screen, you'll see this advertisement from a magazine of the, the Marlboro Man. Um, but they were the largest advertiser um, during this period of time. Gannett, who was one of the largest newspaper monopolies in the country back in the 1980s, they brought in annually about 200 million from billboard advertising alone. So not only were they uh, a newspaper um, company, but they also owned a lot of the billboards throughout the United States. And, and they generated around 200 million a year just from billboard advertising. And in today's money, just to translate that, that's well over $600 million. Um, that's just from billboard advertising alone. 
the thing is like back then in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, they all knew that cigarettes were harmful to people, um, were, were harmful to people's health, caused cancer, but the general public was unaware. And where you saw this reflected is in Gannett newspapers, you wouldn't see hard hitting reports on cigarette smoking. You wouldn't see coverage of scientific studies that were proving this. A lot of these companies very conveniently would not cover these stories at all. Um, and that was to their advantage because again, tobacco represented big money. You know, and media companies actually took the same approach with politicians that they deemed political allies. You know, Ronald Reagan, as we'll find out in a bit, was super friendly to corporations. And even though his administration was rife with corruption, engaging in unconstitutional activities like buying guns from the Iranians and selling them to the Contras in Nicaragua, and sorry, I'm not sure who's calling me. Apologies for that. Um, you know, even though that was happening, um, you know, and was deploying lots of resources to engage in the war on drugs, um, media institutions largely protected Ronald Reagan. I actually remember when I was a kid in school um, being taught history, there were even jokes about it. My history teacher would say that they called Ronald Reagan the Teflon president because no scandal would stick to him. And it's not hard to show why that's true when the media system would not hold you accountable. Um, so let me go back to my slides. And, and here is, I think, something that Ben Bakdikian summarizes about the power of media companies. He says that through consolidation, corporations knew that they had the power to treat some unlike subjects accurately, but briefly, and to treat subjects favorable to the corporate ethic frequently and in depth. And to me, this actually resonates with um, a lot of where I started getting kind of politicized around media representation, you know, at the turn of the 21st century, post 9-11, the drumbeat to war in Iraq, I would see constant coverage of people talking about why it made sense to go into, you know, go into Iraq, that there were weapons of mass destruction. And anti-war voices were few and far between. And, and oftentimes, you know, especially in the 24-hour news cycle, when you put someone in who is has an oppositional voice, but then you have a steady chorus of people saying the complete opposite, that individual looks like the outlier. Um, and that is, I think, summarizes some of what corporations figured out moving into the 1980s, that consolidation and having more control over media companies uh, gave them the power to really pick and choose pub, you know, what people focused on in public discourse. So, and ultimately, you know, pick the discourse that was going to be most helpful to their bottom line. Um, I wanted to, in this context, introduce a, a term that, you know, describes the danger in this type of power. Um, and it's a, it's a heady term. So uh, I've tried to kind of you know, um, make it as accessible as possible, but it's, uh, it's this term called cultural hegemony, which refers to the ability of a dominant class to impose its worldview, morals, and ideas to the rest of the population by shaping the status quo. Um, and there's actually, I'm going to share here, um, a set of graphics that uh, a really incredible cultural organizing organization, I mean, I'll get myself out of the way, um, Ajitarte, um, Ajitarte Cultural Works produced. Um, I know they do a lot of work on the, on the East Coast, but also in Puerto Rico. Um, but they produced this kind of, this Instagram thread on cultural hegemony, which I found super accessible. And I, I pulled a couple of the graphics out for you. Um, and it has a definition here, which is also in the chat. Um, and, but it's this idea of a dominant class being able to shape what is the status quo you know, shape what is normalized in society. And it was a concept developed by Antonio Gramsci, who was a, a Marxist theorist um, during Benito Mussolini's um, fascist regime uh, in Italy. And, um, you know, you know the, the thing that the last slide I wanted to kind of point your attention to 
there are kind of structures in our society that shape meaning for us, you know, from government, schools, the church, and media. And oftentimes these, you know, these individual systems work in concert to protect certain ideas or institutions. You know, and that does as a as a kind of hat tip to our folks in Minneapolis. You know, I think of a lot of the latest, you know, the latest police killing that we saw of Dante Wright in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. <clears throat> you know, even now in this moment where a conversation to defund the police has been pushed to the center, you know, you can turn on MSNBC, a progressive news outlet, and you find them giving equal airtime to a law enforcement official. It's almost you know, almost like clockwork, I will always see at least some sort of former police, some, you know, some law enforcement official commenting on the killing of another black person, you know, so hegemony works in ways in which, you know, uh, through media institutions can reinforce the institutions that are valued and where the attention goes. Um, And I bring this up because this concept is actually highly influential and shaping the analysis of media justice. And as many people, um, you know, many people who attended the gathering at Highlander were, were studied up on this. Um, and y'all have the link in the chat if you want to check out this, this cool Instagram thread. The other thing is, you know, the name of the game for media corporations around media consolidation was to make more money and increase their profit margins. Um, and they did that pretty effectively throughout the 80s and 90s. Um, and they continue to find more ways to make more money. So I have another kind of quiz question. This is, in fact, worth points. So if you can get back to Menti, um, and if my folks can paste the, the link in the chat, um, we're going to go through another question. And I will give it just a minute for folks to get there. And here we go. I keep saying a minute, and then I'm like, Two seconds later, I I recognize that. All right. So remember, faster gets more points. How else did media corporations increase their profit margins? So this is a select all that applies. So you can select any of these that you think are right. Um, You can not select one that you think I just put in there to throw you off. So increasing advertising space, laying staff off, producing sensational content, cutting production costs. All right. They were all right. <laughs> they were all actually correct. Um, so it was definitely all of the above. It was actually common knowledge among Wall Street investors that you could buy up a newspaper and increase profit margins up to 40% by just doing all of these things. They would come in and the, you know, if advertising only took up 10% of the space in the newspaper, they would come in and Oh, my bad. Did I, did I mess up? I could only select one. I messed up. That's, that's on me, Benjamin. Sorry about that. Um, so, you know, the, the, um, they could do all of these. And so they would come in and if 15% of your newspaper was advertising, they would increase that to 25% or 40%, you know, and essentially replace reporting and journalism with more ads. Um, we see that obviously, I'm sure you all feel this if you watch live TV, the ads will just never stop or anytime you watch the Super Bowl. Um, this is a way to generate more revenue. It's a, it's a very tried and true tactic. A lot of times we hear in mergers, people tell us like, oh, this is going to create more jobs. But history has been fairly consistent on this point. Anytime we see a merger, there are always layoffs. Inevitably, people will get laid off and it's a strategic way to continue to cut costs. It's not about um, improving the quality of the work, of the content. It's all about just making more money for Wall Street investors. Producing sensational content, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, of just, you know, there's that old adage around newspapers. If it bleeds, it leads, meaning that like the more sensational the content the likelier, more likelier we are to actually like retain an audience and get more engagement, which is exactly the same logic um, that a lot of algorithms operate on, on social media platforms. It's the more enraging content that has higher engagement and cutting production costs, you know, doing stuff cheaper, um, eliminating benefits, eliminating infrastructure, 
closing down offices. Um, now, in in part one of this workshop, we actually, and actually we can go to the leaderboards here, see if my leaderboard is actually working this time. Let's see. All right, here we go. What are we seeing? All right, now. Okay. Whoa, you see that? So Benjamin, you, even though you only were able to answer one, you jumped up to the top score. Um, Shuba is coming in second. Chad is still still at the very top, coming in third. So wonderful. Um, all right, let's keep rolling. So, you know, in part one of this workshop, I talked about how racist narratives that were seeded through media, um, you know, we saw racist narratives like, and actually here it's just a couple clips from that book, Media Monopoly, that goes into some of the thinking behind, you know, increasing costs. And it, it was just common knowledge among Wall Street investors and corporations that were buying up media companies that the purpose, the reason to do it was because you could generate more profit. It wasn't because they wanted to do better business or whatever, even though that that's publicly a lot of what we hear from these corporations. Um, and I'm sure uh, the moment that we hear of another, actually, we heard this most recently with the Sprint T-Mobile merger of just how wonderful it was going to be for everyone and how much it was going to lower prices. And uh, even though it's only been a couple of years since they merged, they they started raising prices. Um, anyway, so again, that's that's the kind of intent behind consolidation. It's to generate more profit. And often it, it's done at the expense of the content that these media institutions used to, used to produce. <clears throat> um, going on to the next slide, as I was talking about in part one, I ended up um, touching on a lot of the racist narratives that we saw in, you know, in early media. Um, let me see if I, there we go. You know, we saw like the savagery of natives. We saw that reflected a lot in the early newspapers, the cr criminality of black people, the disease ridden, yeah, apologies, content warning, um, the disease ridden um, immigrants, you know, all of these were narratives that um, were, you know, both good for establishing a white dominant status quo and were also, you know, highly profitable. Um, cool. We also see this, you know, in the 1980s and throughout the 1990s with the declaration of the war on drugs where the perpetuation of images of cops breaking down doors um, of arresting black people, you know, representations that were deeply racist. We consistently saw those images throughout media. Um, and I wanted to play a short video of one of those narratives that kind of emerged and was popularized in the late eighties and early nineties. It's captured in the term super predators. And I'll play um, the campaign for fair sentencing of youth, they produced this video about super predators um, and about where that myth came from. Um, and let me go ahead and share my screen and play that. Let's see if I can actually share my screen. There we go. Um, share. The super predator myth was a deeply harmful racist fabrication. It was popularized in the mid 1990s. This myth warned of black and brown teenagers perpetrating a violent crime wave. It had a devastating impact on our laws and policies and consequently on individuals and families nationwide. But why did a theory with no basis in reality take hold? Going all the way back to slavery and throughout our history, Black children have been robbed of their youth and denied the protections of childhood. Along with being presumed guilty and dangerous, Black children have always been perceived as older than they are, treated as adults, and punished severely. Black children were the human property of slaveholders and therefore not the beneficiaries of whatever rights human beings were afforded. Southern society objectified and viewed Black children as valuable commodities. This would evolve into Jim Crow justice for Black youth, denying them access to white institutions of reform, rooted in the belief that Black youth were undeserving subjects of the white-dominated parental state. To this day, Black children suffer the horrifying consequences of this history, including disproportionate and harsh punishment at the hands of our legal system. A particularly damaging consequence took hold in the 1990s as the war on drugs raged and levels of crime rose around the country. 
Instead of seeking to understand and trying to eradicate the root causes of this, policymakers, the media, prosecutors, and other powerful stakeholders fell back on the long-held racist, dehumanizing narratives about young Black boys. Stories of youth committing crimes were sensationalized regularly, even by trusted news outlets. A Princeton criminologist named John DiULio cemented this racist, fictitious depiction of youth of color, especially Black youth, when in 1995 he wrote a standard weekly article called The Coming of the Super Predators. Super predator, a racist, dehumanizing choice of words, a label assigned to children that painted them as ruthless, wild animals, and in a single turn of phrase, stripped away their humanity. The article in DiIulio's future publications stated that a juvenile crime wave would double in the next 10 years and stoked a new white fear of Black children. The claims perpetuated by DiIulio were discriminatory, misguided, and above all, false. So I'm going to pause it right there and come on back just for the sake of time. But just to give you a sense that like you had this kind of perpetuation of a story that was deeply, deeply racist. But this was a term that through that, um, you know, through that, uh, and I can stop sharing my screen. There we go. Um, that was a term that through, through media from that op-ed that John DeLulo wrote, just spread like wildfire and shaped representation. Um, cool, thank you. And you know, and we saw this representation over and over again from newspaper articles to the way crime was covered on TV to movies. You know, it shaped policy. You know, we saw punitive uh, sentencing laws get passed at the federal, state, and local level. I actually, remember you know, growing up around laws in California that prosecuted kids as adults. You know, in fact, my cousin was one of them. He's, he's currently serving a life sentence at a prison in, in California. So not only did it shape laws, but it also was highly profitable for media companies. You know, and the thing is, like, it didn't actually matter if it was fundamentally true or not. And, you know, I put up here as a slide, this Gallup poll, which has been asking people you know, for since about 1989, if they think that crime is up in the area that they live in compared to a year ago. And pretty much every year, without exception, probably the only exception was 2001, oddly, um, a majority of people thought that crime was going up. This is every single year since 1989. Um, and yet, when you look at all the quote unquote crime statistics, which are, to be honest, just a reflection of racist over-policing. It shows that crime has been consistently declining since about the early 1990s. So media companies have figured out that if we keep talking about crime, we can retain and grow our audience and increase our profit margins, even if the stories they're telling are not necessarily true. All right, so we're gonna jump back in. So a little quiz. These, this next question is definitely worth points. So get over to Menti if you're not yet, and uh, I'm sure the link will be in the chat box. And here we go. And if I did multiple choice again, you might have to forgive me. Which four companies started NBC? So you'll have five choices here, I believe. Was it United Fruit Company, Ford Motor Company, General Electric, AT&T, and Westinghouse? I think you just need one to get it right. If I, if I messed up on my settings again, that's probably true. Let's see what we got. All right. Everybody wins. This is just, just like, just like Oprah, everybody wins. Um, cool. Awesome. That's right. All of these companies were the four companies. Um, here's another quiz question then for you. And actually you might get the leaderboard here. Let's see. Yeah. The leaderboard's coming up. So how do we do? Okay. All right. Okay, so we're seeing changes here on the leaderboard. This is exciting. It's, this is anybody's game, I'm telling you. Um, okay, next question we're going to jump into. And here we go. All right. Which industry between the 50s and 90s spent the most on advertising? Was it oil? Was it banking? Or was it tobacco? 
Okay. It was, in fact, the tobacco industry. Yes. All right. So let's see how we're doing here on the leaderboard. Okay. And we're seeing, wow, Vanda is just making a comeback here. Tiger Baby is coming right behind. This is great. Um, awesome. Let's keep let's keep rolling. So, <clears throat> um, in the book Media Monopoly by Ben Bakdikian, the author documents how the media system got to be heavily concentrated. And one interesting revelation is that he finds that all of these industries started out, you know, concentrated, you know, to begin with. Um, and <clears throat> you know, one of the one of those industries was AT and T. Um, and here is a graphic, and let me get myself out of the way so that you can see. Speaking of media consolidation, you know, AT and T started out as a natural monopoly. Um, they were allowed to be the single only company providing telephone service throughout the United States, but in exchange, they agreed to provide something that they called universal service, um, or the idea that everyone. Um, had to be served by, you know, everyone needed to have access to a telephone line. Um, now, in the in the mid 1980s, the government broke them up, um, and it was this kind of kicks off our second topic, which we're talking about, which is deregulation. Government broke them up and broke them up into, you know, regional companies, eight regional companies, um, and allowed AT and T to continue being like a long distance telephone provider. Uh, now, this graphic here demonstrates how in a period of roughly about 20 years, AT&T went from being a singular monopoly to pretty much reconstructing itself into two companies. Today, those two companies, the two big ones are AT&T and Verizon. So while we might have broken up a monopoly in the mid-1980s, by about the early 2000s, what we had was a duopoly with two big major companies. And... This just kind of shows you some of the different financial transactions throughout that time period um, and just shows you that they've basically been able to reconstruct themselves, you know. All right. So, um, you know, talking about deregulation, it's the other condition that those activists in that the Highlander Center in 2002 were really worried with um, in the chat. Um, actually, we're not going to do that just for the sake of time. Um, I'm actually going to play a video by... Uh, my friend Joe Torres um, talking about news for all the people. Um, and it goes into this kind of period of deregulation in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen there so you can watch that. Let's see. All right. Here we go. <laughs> A lot of these rules that the FC passed that um, the help broadcast is more accountable when Reagan comes along in the 1980s, his FCC under Chairman Mark Fowler starts to undo this, this progress. And there's a, there's a few things they did under, under the direction of Mark Fowler, right? Uh, the agency rescinded the regulations that require broadcasters to operate a station uh, for a minimum of three years before selling it. And increased from seven to 12, the cap on the number of AM and FM radio stations a company could own. And increased the caps on ownership of TV stations, so long as those stations did not reach 25% of the national viewer audience. It increased the number of stations the network basically can own. He transformed the licensing process into mere formality by eliminating the need for broadcasters to fill out detailed program logs, by ending ascertainment requirements, and by allowing stations to apply for renewals by postcard application. He also ended any aggressive enforcement of the Equal Employment Opportunity Rules and eliminated broadcasters' obligation to air a certain percentage of public service programming. More mergers were happening. General Electric bought NBC and the Capital Cities Communications bought up ABC networks. So that begins a process in the early 1980s of rescinding or, or turning back the gains being made to democratize our airways by people of color and other folks as well. And then uh, the, the 1990s come in the 1995, the Republican Congress uh, rescinds the tax certificate program. That was really the main instrument that resulted in increasing the percentage of people of color owning broadcast stations from one to three percent. Well, that's not a high number, three percent. 
it still represents like the greatest increase in minority ownership in our nation's history over that 17, 18 year period. That program is rescinded, right? And, and, and then a year later, 1996, Bill Clinton signs the 1996 Telecom Act. And the Telecom Act unleashes a new wave of consolidation. It, it, it decimates radio, right? It gets rid of ownership caps. The number of radio stations a company has been owned. Uh, at the time, you couldn't own more than 40 radio stations nationwide. And the number of stations a radio company can own nationwide, that, that cap is eliminated. So basically, Clear Channel goes from owning 40 stations in 1996 to 1,200 stations in a, in, in, in a matter uh, of a couple of years. So... That just goes into some of what happened in the 1990s in terms of deregulation. Um, so a few things to note. So we see deregulation in the 1980s, 1990s, and it makes it easier for companies to merge. This is like a lot of what Joe was talking about in the video with Reagan's FCC and all the deregulation they did to allow for more mergers. Um, and so this is where we start to see that 50 number of companies in 1980 who owned the vast majority of media really start to shrink, um, you know, and there, there were limits prior to 1980 on the like limits of what you could own. So, you know, you weren't allowed to own, um, if you were a cable provider, the TV channels that you were delivering to people, but deregulation through the 1980s and in, and in 1996 through the Telecom Act did away with that requirement. And so years later, like when, Comcast decided to merge with NBC Universal in 2011, they could do that because at that point, regulation was out of the way and they were allowed to merge. Um, take it forward to the digital age, Facebook purchasing Instagram, another social media platform in 2012 for like a billion dollars. You know, that wouldn't have been possible before because regulation would have largely prohibited that kind of a merger. Um, and even though, as, as I was explaining here, we saw the breakup of Ma Bell, um, of AT&T, they basically reconstructed themselves in the span of a couple decades. So, you know, this is how we went and, you know, in from a span of like, you know, what was it, 20 years to going from, you know, 50 companies that own the vast majority of the media that we consume to, you know, about six companies. And these are the six that, you know, stood the test of time over those 20 years. General Electric, which we've heard of before, News Corporation, which um, owned Fox um, and all the kind of Fox News and those those um, those industries. Disney, um, which of course you know owns the very popular ESPN, Viacom, Time Warner, and CBS. Um, so, you know, this aggressive deregulation that was introduced in the 1980s uh, under the Reagan administration was guided by this philosophy of small government. And I think if y'all have, you know, are a student of history, I'm sure you've heard um, the clip of Ronald Reagan, you know, talking about um, government. And I'm sure this was from his inauguration, I think in, in, 80, in 1980. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. You know, government is the problem. So the idea that like we got to strip regulation out of the way, and they paired this belief in small government with an approach to ec economic policy that they called, you know, in the 1980s it was called Reaganomics, or this idea of an unrestricted, you know, free market. Um, hold on, let me make sure I'm switching slides. Yeah, there we go. Um, and let me get back to my place here on my notes. And this is just a cartoon, that funny cartoon talking about free markets. Um, but they paired this belief in small government with this free market economics, which was this view that in capitalism, a competitive and healthy marketplace is one in where businesses get to make their own choices, free from government intervention. Um, so very similar to Reagan's view of government as being the problem. Um, and this isn't necessarily a Republican view alone, you know, free markets were an approach to economic policy across the political spectrum. Yeah, and Joe talked about the 1996 Telecommunications Act, um, and that was done under a Democratic administration. This was an approach to economic policy um, across the political spectrum that allowed for the kind of wave of media consolidation 
and deregulation that we saw. So it didn't really matter what party was in power. This was just kind of the approach. Um, Joe mentioned Clear Channel in the video. You know, a company like Clear Channel, which is one of the largest corporations that owned the vast majority of radio stations across the country, in the in the early to mid '90s, they owned about 40 radio stations, which which is a lot. Um, but you know, by the time you know we came around as an organization in the early 2000s, Clear Channel was a company that owned well over 1,200 radio stations across the country. In fact, like one of the campaigns that we worked on that was a precursor um, to media justice was a campaign to um, to stop Clear Channel from buying this the last kind of independently owned hip hop station in the Bay Area called KMEL back in 2001. And this is a toolkit that we produced way back then to try to engage young people to organize and stop the sale from happening, which didn't happen. And, and the, the campaign pivoted towards holding the institution accountable. Um, so bringing it back to the Highlander Center in 2002, you know, we talked about how media consolidation, deregulation were among the forces that were shaping, you know, media conditions around this convening. And at the time, there really wasn't a movement that was fighting to transform media and technology. The last time we saw kind of activism around media was in the 1970s when several civil rights groups like the NAACP challenged TV licenses away from racist TV stations. But since that time, um, you know, there wasn't really a sector advocating, you know, to, to transform media for people of color. There was kind of a, a group of folks that were advocating to democratize media, but none of those groups were bringing a racial justice lens to their view of media and technology. Um, and at the Highlander convening, there was a key, a key strategic decision that was made to shift terms um, for how we describe media organizing away from media democracy and towards media justice. And Nan Rubin, who was also attending this convening and, and also a giant in the community radio sphere, um, and uh, wrote about you know, this kind of shift. And you know, she said that we thought that transforming the concept to media justice will put our efforts on the same level as other social justice and human rights organizing and give us a new vocabulary to work with in terms of defining our various goals. You know, they recognized that the concept of democracy, you know, fighting for media democracy had been degraded for people of color. And in the US and globally was just distrusted because US interventionism abroad, you know, would either prop up dictators in some places or destabilize democratically elected governments in other places. And they also saw that media justice as a term could bring them closer in proximity to other social justice movements here in the US. Um, now, there were two principles um, that emerged from this convening that everyone who attended agreed to. Um, and I actually found this very interesting because you know, when I think about this convening, I think about them shaping an analysis around media, but both of the principles actually deal with technology as well. They said that first, technology and media must be directed towards social justice. Um, so, it goes back to the belief in the words of Bertolt Brecht, which was a, he was a, a Marxist um, cultural artist and, and, and playwright, you know, this idea and replacing in his quote, media or technology, that art is not a mirror to reflect our reality, but a hammer with which we shape it. So this idea that media and technology exist in service of expanding or accelerating movements for social justice. That was a core principle from this convening that they all agree to that must kind of shape this movement that we call media justice. The second, and here's a, for our KRSM folks, a picture from one of your, one of your producers in your studio. But the second idea uh, principle is that technology and media participation must be structured in a democratic way, meaning that um, communities at the margins should decide how media and technology is created used and allocated. And so I think it's just worth noting that as far back as 2002, they already recognized technology was central to the struggle for media justice. You know, and this was at least a couple of years before the founding of Facebook and Twitter, before the proliferation of tech and policing. You know, they understood back then what we discussed earlier, which is 
innovations in technology will change our relationship to media and what media is capable of doing. So movement seeking to change media must also change technology. Um, I'm going to jump ahead just for the sake of time because I want to make sure I let folks go um, on time, but I, I would invite you all to go to our website and check out our vision statement um, because I actually think it's very reflective of these two principles, um, but I'll, I'll jump ahead for now, uh, but invite you all to check it out. So when our founder, Malkia Devich Cyril, returned from that 2002 convening, they set out to do two things. The first was transform the Youth Media Council into a national organization um, that could campaign for media justice um, you know, at, a, at a national level. That's at the time when we took on the name Center for Media Justice, which was well over a decade ago. And two, they set out to build the media justice movement by helping to start a network, which was initially called the Media Action Grassroots Network and is today a network of over 100 social justice, media, and arts organizations. And there's a lot that we, and here's a wonderful picture from a convening that we had a couple of years ago. Um, and there's a lot that this movement has actually been able to accomplish over this period of time since 2002. We've actually stopped a couple major mergers. Um, you, may have, you may remember that AT&T and T-Mobile actually tried to merge a few years ago. Well, we stopped that. Uh, we stopped the Comcast Time Warner merger. We actually won the passage of local the Local Community Radio Act in 2010, which led to the construction of hundreds of new low power FM radio stations, including, um, you know, our, our wonderful member down in Minneapolis, KRSM. We won net neutrality, you know, the kind of First Amendment rules of the internet. We won the lowering of prison phone calls at a national level. Um, we our network has won local campaigns to ban facial recognition, to dismantle predictive policing, to defund surveillance technology. Um, you know, we actually got Trump and a bunch of his white supremacist friends permanently banned from Twitter. So I'm flexing a little bit when it comes to media justice and our wider movement, because this, this movement has slowly chipped away in a span of about 20 years. Um, a lot of a lot of you know issues that have been shaping itself for for many decades. You know, I'm in awe of reading the notes um, from that 2002 Highlander gathering and seeing people like Janine Jackson, you know, talk about uh, who was the director at Fair uh, Fairness and Accuracy and Reporting, and just talking about how she dreamed of a movement for media and technology for a really long time. And I think the members of our network are a wonderful reflection of kind of those those dreams coming to reality. Um, you know, and I know that 2002 might seem like a long time ago, but, you know, what I've covered here both in part one and part two of this workshop is that the forces that have shaped media and technology are 100 years in the making. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's wonderful to think about what we've been able to accomplish in just 20 years of us being a, a structured movement with a real political analysis. Um, I had one more, you know, thing that I was going to run through for today, but I think I'm going to jump ahead and close us out with one more round of quiz questions and finally decide who is our winner. Um, and let me jump ahead. Um, cool. So if we can get some mentee, these are the last round of questions we're going to go through to decide who is the ultimate winner and is going to get some wonderful prizes from us. So here we go. Question six. Name um, one of the six companies that owns the vast majority of media today. And I've put, um, you can basically put in an answer and just try to try to take a guess. Who do you think is one of those companies that owns the vast majority of media today? So there are six of them today. And we've got less than 10 seconds here and we'll see. The answers popping up. Here we go. All right. So if you said, well, it's at and and there's a bunch of other correct answers, and I believe I collected, I said it correctly. Yeah. So at and and Disney, we had a couple of folks get that right. Um, there are also a few more, um, and I see Disney spelling correctly. It's all good. Um, I know it was moving quickly. 
there are others like Netflix, for example, is another one, believe it or not. Um, Time Warner is another big one. Comcast is a big one um, that wasn't true, um, you know, even 20 years ago. So, all right, that was a, that was a tough one. All right, here comes the next one, y'all. And actually, we'll, we'll do our leaderboard here, see, see where we're at. Okay. So, Vanda, congratulations. Ooh, this leaderboard is going to be it's going to be pretty active in the last couple minutes here. All right, here we go. Question seven. Let's jump on in. Faster gets more points. Google, Android, and YouTube are owned by which corporation? It's funny. I was just talking about this with my staff. Is it Apple Inc? Is it Alphabet Inc? Is it Facebook? And you have about five seconds. Pick the correct answer. Here we go. Ooh, wow, interesting. Oh no, I forgot to set the correct answer. Oh no, that's my fault. Uh, the correct answer was actually Alphabet Inc. And that's my bad. Um, hopefully I didn't do this with this last question. Oh no, that's so wrong. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see, no one gets points on that one. I'm so sorry. Uh, all right, let's see if I got this right for this last question. So let's jump on in. Advertising today is largely based on what? And here are the options. Is it personal user data? Is it the TV show Mad Men? Or is it commercials? And you've got about five seconds to respond here. All right. All right. No, I messed up. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. I did not get that right. Hold on. Let me make this adjustment here because that's not cool. Um, that's the right answer. There we go. And that is the right answer. All right. I'm making sure y'all can't see the screen. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Um, and we've got one more to go. And let's let's dive on in. Present. All right, question nine of nine. Here's the last one. For those of you that answer correctly the last couple of rounds, you got your uh, you got your points. So Mark Zuckerberg owns which of these companies? And you can select any or all that apply. Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, and Messenger. Which of these does Mark Zuckerberg own? All right. Well. Facebook is correct. WhatsApp is correct. They're actually all correct. So wonderful. Let's check in with our leaderboard and let's see where we're at now. Okay. Final standings. And it looks like, whoa, Benjamin with 6,500 points. Congratulations. 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 Well played. Well played. Um, as we, as we close out here, and I, I see that Benjamin and Lizzie and Vanda are top three, so I'm going to make a note of that um, for, for the prizes, um, and we'll get some, some cool stuff out. We'll follow up to get some information to see if we can get some cool stuff out to y'all. Now, to close this out, and I know I'm slightly over time, but I also started slightly late, so I hope you, you will hang with me. Um, you know, I want to make sure that we run through a couple of evaluation questions, um, which will help us improve this workshop, um, but also shape the content um, for future workshops. So I'm hoping you all can take a moment and just fill it out. You can slide from the left if you strongly disagree over to the right if you strongly agree. And the three questions we're just asking today is, did you learn? Did, did you learn a lot today? Um, it might have been stuff that you already knew. So that's also helpful to know. Um, was the workshop interactive? Did the workshop meet your accessibility needs? These things will help us improve. As y'all are doing that, I want to um, take the time to also thank you for hanging with me today. I especially want to thank um, the staff at Media Justice who put in a lot of work to produce this Media Justice Fundamental Series. I want to thank our ASL um, Spanish language and caption interpreters for helping ensure that our event is as accessible to everyone. Um, and uh, while I'm going through it, I can cycle through to the next evaluation question, which is just what's one thing that we could improve? So anything that comes to mind for you, um, if, it's, if it's timing, if it's more slides, more videos, more sound effects, um, 
uh, or you know, a particular kind of bit of feedback, please share it with us. It will help us improve. Um, to dig deeper into our movement for media justice, don't forget to join us next week for a workshop on racialized disinformation led by my colleague, Aaron Shields, um, which will happen next Tuesday, April 20th. Um, and I'll put up a, a link, or there should be a link coming into the chat for you to RSVP for that workshop. It's happening next Tuesday. Um, more videos will help for sure. And breakout room discussions, absolutely. And I think we can probably incorporate that in some of these upcoming workshops. Um, yeah, okay. That's, that's a great suggestion, letting folks know the tools that they're going to be using. Uh, more connection time and breakouts. I feel that 100%. I really appreciate that feedback. Um, all right, so wonderful. I just to close out, I just want to say again, thank you to you all for hanging with me and for being a part of Media Justice 101. And especially for those of you who were here for part one, for both part one and part two. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.